I want to begin uh, this morning with reading a Bible passage together. So everyone, open your Bible apps. <laughs> open your Bibles and uh, turn to Titus chapter 2. And let's, let's read together. Let's do congregational reading. Read together. It's okay if you're on, in different versions. Let's read together Titus chapter 2 verses 1 to 10. Titus chapter 2 verses 1 to 10. Um, when you have found it, hopefully you have it all. Yes, almost. Okay, well, we'll go ahead. And when you find it, catch up with us. Verses 1 to 10. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. The older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Verse 6. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Now, when you read the Bible, um, how many of you, when you read the Bible, how many of you pay attention to uh, the chapter headers or the section headers? There's sometimes little little uh, inscriptions there, they're called. Um, in the book of Psalms, the, the headers or the inscriptions uh, in the chapters of Psalms, I have them. They help us to identify who wrote the Psalms. It, it indicates the authorship. Um, and, you know, were these uh, headers for the Psalms, at least, were they written by the original authors? Meaning, is it a canon part of Scripture? Um, I will say I don't know, but it's been carried through historically as part of the Bible to help us just understand who wrote it, at least. And there's corresponding Scriptures that back up several of these psalms the claims of authorship to these psalms so we know at least that they're accurate jesus himself actually quotes one of the psalms and he says david says this and so you know if nothing else you can trust jesus right um but whether or not they're part of the actual canon scriptures we don't know but they are helpful to us now that's for the book of psalms um but outside of the book of psalms in your bibles when you see these headers these were headers that have been added by editors who put together the Bible. We, we know there's different publishing houses, different editors, and as they, as they read to help us along, they look at a section, they break it down into chunks, and they say, this is what we feel like this section is about, and so they'll put a little title in there. Um, meaning, meaning that outside of the Psalms, we know for sure that these headers are not the inspired Word of God. They are helpful. But they are not the inspired Word of God. And as you read them, as you look at these titles, think of them as commentary that's been added through the years by different folks who have come in touch with Scripture as a means to help us understanding, understanding that they may possibly be tainted by man's perspective and point of view. So taking it with, I don't want to say grain of salt because we do. There is some help in that in, in these titles. Um, the headers can also be helpful if you're, you know, supposed to read ahead for Bible study and you hadn't. So you can scan the chapter and you know at least what it's talking about, so you don't sound completely oblivious. No, don't do that, please. Please actually read the Bible and prepare for Bible study. But here's the thing: having said all of that, um, part of what the Lord put on my heart. For this morning to share with you stems from a uh, section heading for Titus chapter 2. Now the passage that we just read together, verses 1 to 10 in chapter 2, this was uh, in, these were instructions from Paul to Titus. We, we understand this is a letter that Paul wrote to Titus 
and Paul told Titus, look, you got to take care of some things here in this church, and here's the problems you need to deal with. And the, this was in Crete, in Crete, one of the islands in Greece. And Paul says, Titus, go here. You've been sent here. There's problems in this church. Deal with these things. You are going to need to be a help there. And part of the instructions that we just read um, in my Bible, uh, my Bible is a Schofield study Bible. And uh, the heading for this section is the pastoral work, the pastoral work of a true minister. That's the heading for the whole chapter two. For verses one to 10, there's a subheading marked as ministry toward various groups. Right? And if we look, verse 1 begins with this, But as for you, he's writing to Titus, But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. So when we look at this verse, we, we start with that, but as for you. So when you read it, if you read this in, in a vacuum by itself, it's like, what is he talking about in reference to, but as for you? So we would go back and look at chapter 1, which ended with this, that those who are defiled and unbelieving, to them nothing is true, or nothing is pure, but even their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. So there is this group of people, they are a problem. But as for you, Titus, you will not be like them. You cannot be like them. You cannot walk in their way. And so you will not be like them. You, as for you, you need to speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Other translations of, of uh, the end of verse 1, it says, You, however, must teach what is appropriate for to sound doctrine. Another version says, you must proclaim the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Teach what is consistent with sound doctrine. Do you see that, that pattern there? What you need to do, Titus, is you need to speak and you need to teach what fits the Word of God. Because these other people, they're deviating from the Word of God. They are drawing things from thin air. They're making up stuff. They're, they're falling on men's tradition. You, the only thing that you will speak to is the Word of God. Um, the Amplify version, I like this. But as for you, teach the things which are in agreement with sound doctrine, in parentheses, which produces men and women of good character whose lifestyle identifies them as true Christians. I mean, that's really amplified, right? You're giving us the gist of what Paul is saying. So in, in other words, in other words, what Paul says right off the bat is, for a minister, which Titus is a minister. A minister, what's a minister? A minister is someone who does the bidding of his master. Right? A lot of times we, we, we you know, look at people who serve in church and they have a title, they're the minister, and, and it's, it's, it's not a glorious title. You're a servant. You really are a servant. And so Paul says, Titus, you are a servant. For a true servant, someone who's a true servant, that you would uh, hear... In chapter 2, Paul defines the pastoral work of a true minister, a true servant. What is pastoral work? The word pastor is someone who leads, who shepherds. So pastoral work is what you would do, what is, uh, I guess, considered the work of shepherding a flock. How would you tend to the flock? And so this work, this chapter, does not exist in a vacuum for just a minister. Because with a pastor, with a shepherd, there has to be a flock. So these instructions are for the whole church as a whole. And, and this work here is defined. And so the way that Schofield, um, you know, divided these chapters and put in the headings, what he's saying is the pastoral work of a true minister is to teach the congregation how to live in the manner that follows or is in agreement with is consistent with sound doctrine the work of a minister is to teach the congregation to live in a way that is consistent that agrees with the word of god so paul saying titus this is your work you are to be a true minister and this is your work teach your congregation to live in a way that does not deviate from the doctrine from the word of god 
and verses 1 to 10 covers, Titus, this covers your ministry to the various groups. What do we, what do we learn from that? Ministry is not just about the physical well-being and taking care of a person's well-being physically. Ministry is about here is a set of guidelines and you need to make sure people fall in line with the Word of God. Ministry involves correction. When, when the shepherd is leading, he's going to make sure, the sheep that stray, he's going to make sure they come back within the flock because if they go astray, they're, they're on their own. You know about this, right? You know how dumb sheep are. Sheep left to their own devices, number one, they can't shear their wool. They're going to get, you know, it's going to just keep growing. They're going to become overburdened. They don't know how to find food. They're going to stand in a spot and they eat until the grass is bare, surrounded by grass. Oh, I'm hungry. I don't know where to go. You know, sheep are, are dumb. They can't take care of themselves. You need to bring the sheep under the direction of God, Titus. This is your work. And it doesn't happen in a vacuum. And so ministry is instruction. Ministry is instruction to lead, to guide the people of God. And chapter 2, if you skip ahead to verse 15, we see chapter 2 ends with this. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. So, Titus, you're not just to say these things. This is not just about you saying these things, but you need to exhort. Exhort meaning you, you, you entreat people, you encourage them, you strengthen them to do these things, and if necessary, you beg. And so that's your work as a minister. You need to strengthen people to do these things. You need to encourage them. And when need it be, you need to beg them. But also you need to rebuke, to convict when people are not doing what they should do. You need to find fault with people. These are the responsibilities of the minister, to find fault where there is fault to be found, to correct, to admonish, and at times to demand an explanation. These are not easy things for a minister to do. And you need to do all of this with all authority coming from God. And as you do it, let no one despise you. This is hard work. Forget about just the correction, but to do it with authority and to let no one despise you as you're doing it, that's a tall order for Titus to receive here. And so it's demanding. It's going to be demanding work. So Paul's basically saying, look, here is a template. This, these are the set of rules. And this is how the church, the people of God, ought to live. You need to speak these things and exhort and rebuke. And as necessary, make sure the church body, the congregation, all the people of God are operating within this template. Which brings me to my next point. The section heading that I just shared with you actually was not what took me down this train of thought. That's what's in my Bible, but the section heading that, that really piqued my interest was found in most of the other Bibles in our house and in the version I looked at online. Um, it wasn't the pastoral work of a true minister. The, the section heading which really made me stop and think this week was, for verses 1 to 10, was qualities of a sound church. I don't know if you do any of you have that in your Bible. Qualities, verses 1 to 10. Qualities of a sound church. Now, Tony and Danielle, they're moving away. They're going to Texas. So they're going to be looking for a church to attend in Texas. And in this day and age, in this day and age, short of a personal recommendation from someone who has either been to a church or knows a pastor or knows the members there, short of a personal recommendation, how else do you learn about a prospective church? You go online. You go online and you look, um, visit. Well, first of all, when possible, you go and attend their service. Be a part of the community and get to know people there and get to know what the church is like. But even before that, you kind of want to know a little bit about a church before you go. So you look at the website. Um, what does a church website tell you? A church website tells you how much budget they set aside for making a nice website. That's, I, I will tell you this because a lot of, there's churches that have awesome websites and says a lot of nice things and you go and it's like, this is kind of like one of those dating profiles where you meet the person and you're nothing like how you described yourself. 
there are churches that have shabby websites, but you know what's going on in the church is really healthy. There's there's all kinds of different um, matches and mismatches between the website and what the church actually is. So if if anything, take that with a grain of salt. Well, what's the next step then? You can watch, you know, some of their live streams or recorder services. I mean, nowadays, almost everybody's got a live stream or a recorder service because, you know, thank you, God, for coronavirus. And so we've, we've all had access to what the church service is like. And so you can tune in. You can hear the teaching to see if the teaching is, is I don't want to say good because we're not judging whether or not it's a good speaker, but you want to see is this teaching according to the Bible? Is this, are, are these pastors, are they true to God's word? And then you can, you know, maybe you can check out their, their worship, see if you like their music, if it, you know, is toe tapping good or not. You, you can get to know a little bit about a church through how they present themselves online. But what's missing in all of this? The people, the church itself. The people in the church, you, you don't get to know the people by listening to a service. You don't get to know the brothers and sisters by listening to the worship. You, you might understand what musical skills they have and you know what kind of music style they, they like and whether or not they use fog machines. Uh, but outside of that, you don't really get to know the people in the church. And as you're reading Titus chapter 2, remember that heading, the qualities of a sound church. right? If you look at that, heading and you hadn't read verses 1 to 10 yet, you might be thinking, well, you know, obviously, well, as you read this, you, you would say the qualities of a sound church is that the pastor, the pastor teaches the congregation according to God's doctrine, right? And, and that's what Paul's teaching Titus. This is how you ought to be a minister. And yes, that is part of the qualities of a sound church. But again, like I said, this teaching does not and cannot exist in a vacuum just at the pulpit. A big part of what makes a sound church is how does a congregation receive these exhortations and rebukes? What do they do with it? Do they live? Do they listen and then choose to live and follow God's word and live according to God's teaching? So the qualities of a sound church does not rest solely on the pastor. The qualities of the sound church does not rest solely on the pastor. Yes, like I said, a, a good pastor, a true minister, will shepherd his flock, but his flock has got to listen. The flock has got to listen, because when you think about it, you know, like I said, what makes a church sound is the people, because that is the church. The church is the assembly those who have been called out from the world who are assembled together, the church is not the pastor in isolation. We, as a church, we are the body of Christ. We are the vessel through which God has chosen to display His glory and His wisdom to the principalities in the heavenly places. I am not making this stuff up. We've been reading this. In the scriptures, God looks at each church and he says, through each church, as they listen and follow my commands, my desire, God says, is to display my wisdom through this church body. The body itself is the church. And so when it comes to finding a good church, when it comes time to find a good church, a big part of the search will be getting to know the people at the church, getting to know the congregation you know seeing how they live it's it's one thing it's one thing to have a true minister who pastors according to sound doctrine but what good is that if nobody listens what good is it if the the the, the best pastor who follows the word of god stands to teach and everybody in the congregation is that we, we've heard that all before. We, we don't need this. We we're going to live the way we want to live because Jesus is love and he forgives all our sins. And so how do I experience more grace? By sinning all the more. Right? And, and so, again, that, that, that soundness of a church is not just on a pastor. And so to get to know a church, to get to know whether the church is sound or not, you need to invest yourself into a church to know if it's a sound church. 
well, okay, but how do we know if it's okay to start investing yourself in the church until you know it's a sound church? And how do you, the only way to get to know if it's a sound church if is to go there and invest yourself. Which comes first? What do you do? Well, part of that, part of that is you get to know the church at some level without getting to know the people. You at least know the teaching is good. It's true to God's word. And you pray. You pray and experience the leading of the Lord directing you, at least letting you know, I don't feel good about this church. I don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it. Something is off. That perhaps is God saying, don't go to this church. And this other church, I feel really peaceful about this place. Let's go and check it out. Right? So at, at, the, at the very um, initial level, God directs. But then as you go, before you come to finding the perfect church, you need to invest yourself. And I will tell you, there is no perfect church. I know some of you are thinking, but we're in one right now. No, there is no perfect church because you're in it. I'm sorry. You as in us, we as people, none of us are perfect. We all have our faults. The minute we become part of a church, we bring ourselves into that church. We bring our faults. We bring our, our natural tendencies. No church is perfect because there are people in it. When you found a perfect church, it will be an empty building. Oh no, it'll be in church, in heaven. But the, the, so, so don't think about finding a perfect church. There are people I know who have gone, they're, they're serial churchers, right? One church after another, after another, because there's always gonna be a problem. And the minute a little problem comes up, man, I thought this was the best church, but no. I mean, obviously there are some big issues where there, there's warning signs and God says, you, you gotta get out. But if, if you spend your life just flitting from one church to another to another, you'll never invest yourself. And at some point, you just need to trust God. Okay, I think this is the right place, but, you know, give me a sign, you know, tell, tell me if this is wrong. And then you, you invest yourself into the congregation. You become part of the body. You get to know the people. You allow people to get to know you. Open yourself up, and you... You, you then become part of that body and you start to exist in that sound church, in that sound body, you know. And here's the thing. With churches, it is important, it is important, important, important that you invest yourself. Because God forbid you're, you're going to a church and, and you've been going and you've been receiving, you've been blessed, and 10 years later, you're still just receiving and being blessed. Because 10 years later, someone else comes to church, they're coming to visit, and they want to get to know the body of Christ. You know, well, I heard this pastor say, the way to get to know if a church is a sound church is to go and get to know people, right? That's a good sermon right there. And so people go, and they meet you, and they notice that you're just taking and taking and taking. That's not, that's not a good testimony. That's not a good witness to have. People are going to say, wow, this is a church of people who just come and receive. I like this church. I'm going to do the same thing. Then that's, that's not sound living. Why is that not sound living? Because when you read, when we read verses 1 through 10 in Titus chapter 2, you notice as Paul is giving instruction for people and how to live, a lot of what he's saying there is relational. It's relational. Speaking of being temperate, having not not having an ill temper what does that matter if you exist in a vacuum having good temper having patience all of these things that paul is telling titus to teach it relates to not com not exclusively but it deals with how we relate to one another and so in a church you cannot exist in in your own little seclusion and and just say i'm here to receive we are called to be a sound church by living together, by walking together, by being part of each other's lives. That's the instruction that Paul gives to Titus. You know, it's, it's about how we relate to one another. This is a question we have to ask ourselves. Are, am I building relationships within the church? And by relationship, I don't mean, oh, how are you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Praise the Lord. Amen. Right? That, that, okay, that's, that's a beginning. That's a beginning. That's a shallow beginning. And then you dig deeper. Allow yourselves to dig deeper into getting to know people in the church. We don't have that many people. It's, it's not hard to get to know everyone well. It's not. 
And and so God's offered us this opportunity where we can truly, really exercise what it means to love one another. It's a calling that we've been given. Love one another, live in harmony with each other as much as you are able, be of one mind. Does any of this sound foreign to you? I hope not because this is what we've been reading in letter after letter after letter from Paul to the churches. This is what is expected of us. Now here's the thing, there's going to be a reckoning one day. There is going to be a reckoning one day when we go to meet the Lord. We're all going to go at different times, most likely. It'd be kind of weird if all of us went at once. But there's going to be a day when each of us comes before our Lord Jesus Christ. And there will be a reckoning. What is a reckoning? You're, you're, you're going to give an account of how you've spent your life. And the Lord will open his Google spreadsheet because in heaven there is no Microsoft. And, <laughs> sorry, editorializing. He's, he's going to bring out, I, I don't know how God's going to do this, but he's going to have an account of how you've spent your life, how you've spent every moment, every minute. And, and God's going to have a reckoning. He's going to say, I'm going to choose Martine. He's going to say, Martine, Martine, for this season in your life, I brought you to this church because I wanted you to be a blessing to Michael. How do you plead? And then you would answer and say, well, I did the best I could. Or you can say, Michael, who's, who's Michael? <laughs> right? And, and God put us in a body to be a blessing. Now, may, maybe you've, you've been able to identify where God has desired for you to minister to a specific person. Maybe you haven't been able to figure that out. You know, this morning, if I ask you, to think of one face. Think of one face in this church body that you've been a blessing to. Some of you may say, well, I don't really know because I just do what I should do as God calls me and I'm a blessing to everyone around me without knowing it. You know, I'm so, okay, good, good, good for you then. But some of you may be able to think, okay, yeah, I've been a help to this person, maybe. I've been an encouragement to this brother. I've prayed for this sister. I've done, Lord, I've done what you asked me to do and I pray that it's a blessing. Hopefully, hopefully, each of you can think of at least one name, one face that fits that. If you can't, if you absolutely can't, it's not too late because you're still here. You are still drawing breath. As long as you are still here, God is saying you have time still to invest yourself into becoming part of the body. Not just gaining something from the body, but being a part of what makes the church a sound church. And so the question then should change from how can I find a sound church to how can I be part of a sound church? Not just how do I find a sound church, but how do I become part of that sound church and become what makes that church a sound church? And as I said, if in your life you can't think of how you've been a blessing, it's not too late. Paul gives these instructions to Titus. We have these instructions. We have, we have time. We still have time. The Lord says, redeem your time. Redeem your time. Make the most of the days that He has given you. Think of how you can be a blessing to someone. Think of how you, maybe, maybe, maybe you shouldn't be the one thinking about it. Maybe you should be praying. Maybe this is what we should do this morning. Let, let's pray. Let, let's bow our heads and spend a, a moment in quiet prayer. And maybe, I hope you all would do this, come to the Lord and ask, Lord, here we are. You put us here. You put me here. Who can I be? Who, 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 how, how will you use me to be a blessing to someone? Show me a face, Lord. Show me a direction, something I can do. So let, let's bow our heads. Let's all bow our heads. And in your own way, come before the Lord and seek out how he would 
choose to make you a blessing to someone in this season. Jesus, I pray that you would speak to us this morning. We've been counting every blessing. In every season, you have been good to us, Lord. But Lord, we also recognize as we count every blessing that in every season, you have been good to us through someone. And so I pray this morning for us as a congregation that this morning we would choose, we would resolve, Lord, to avail ourselves to you, to be of use in your kingdom, that we can be used, Lord, as a vessel to be a blessing to someone else. We, we, we're really good at counting our blessings, Lord, and what we have received. Start, Lord, this morning with making us part of that equation for someone else. And as we come before you, Spirit, I pray that you would come and work in each of our hearts, Lord, and lead us to see how we can be a blessing to someone and whom it is that we can be a blessing to, Lord. I desire to surrender all to you. Everything I have, Jesus, especially my time and my energy, everything I have, I want to lay at your feet and say, Take it, Lord, and use it. Take my will and make it thine, Lord. That my feet would go where you want me to go. My hands would do what you want me to do. My mouth, my lips would say and sing what you want me to say and sing. So that I can be a blessing to someone else today. Help us, Lord, to be a sound church. Help us, Jesus. Help us to be zealous for good works. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.